Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, Friday uh, Australia at Home session. Um, I might just uh, start with some of the, the formalities while we wait for everyone to, to tick in. The first being that I wanted to acknowledge that uh, we're holding this, at least I am holding this today, uh, on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. Uh, I wanna pay my respects to the elders past and present. I'm sure you are spread right across the country and on all sorts of different um, uh, indigenous lands and uh, I wanna acknowledge them and all of their diversity. Uh, the next thing was, uh, I just thought I'd introduce myself. So my name is Daniel Stone. I run a, a, a progressive advocacy company called Principal Co. And um, essentially what we do is try and work with organizations who do a lot of civil society work, a lot of advocacy work to make them more effective and impactful. And through that, a lot of our work involves the creation of uh, images that, are, that, that have meaning and have substance and can persuade people to do things. And that's really the angle through which I came into today's conversation. Um, more on that in a second. Um, a few other little ground rules. Uh, this is part of the Australia at Home series, which many of you have participated in before. Um, so I'll keep the description of that fairly short. Essentially, Australia at Home was an idea that a whole bunch of different civil society organisations had right at the beginning of this kind of COVID uh, crisis, where we thought everyone's kind of panicking, everyone's a bit at home uh, and a bit cooped up and, and really thinking about um, very immediate, urgent uh, challenges. And we wanted to kind of give everyone a space to step back, look a bit more broadly and reflect on some of the uh, larger, uh, longer term challenges or, or um, reflections, I guess, that we weren't able to see in those moments of crisis. And so that's kind of where we're coming from and, and what we try to organise all of our sessions around. The partners that are a part of that are uh, ourselves, Principal Co, as well as uh, uh, I've lost my notes, uh, but I'm going to try and do it off the top of my head. The Centre for Australian Progress, The Guardian, notably uh, Essential Media, um, ACF, the Australian Climate Foundation, and the Australian Communities Council, um, who have all been really, really wonderful people to work with. Uh, as a few little administrative tasks, we're going to be recording this session to share it for, with folk who can't uh, make it. So do let us know if that's a problem for you in any way. I think Hannah has jumped on the, the chat there and made herself known. So message either her or I and, and we'll um, kind of take note of that. We're also gonna keep everybody on mute just while we kind of run through the deck. But we do really want to uh, hear your questions, thoughts and comments. We'll be paying active attention to the chat and we'll try and kind of pull people forward to ask questions or, or provide comments where we can. So um, yeah, do, do please jump in the chat there and throw your thoughts and comments in. Um, and I also want to just really encourage you all to, to have your video on um, so that we can all kind of see each other. I know many of you might be having sort of lunch or, or you know, sitting there and uh, looking out the window while we're also talking, but um, it is nice to, to see us all together there. Today's format's going to be a little bit different from some of the previous Australia at Homes we've done in that... Um, uh, we're actually going to go through a slideshow and see some really, really interesting photos that have been curated by all of the people who are speaking today, which is great because so many of these Zoom calls have just been a lot of people talking to each other, which we, you know, could have done on a phone. So now we're really taking advantage of, of the medium, which I'm really excited about. Before I pull that up and we start that conversation, though, I'm going to begin um, uh, asking uh, each of our uh, panellists uh, something we've kind of started with, uh, started most of our sessions with, which is just asking, how are you going? So Andrew, I might go to you first. How are, how are you going? How have you been feeling over the last month or so? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm very lucky. I get to live on 50 acres of Ngunnawal country and I would like to acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to welcome Indigenous First Nations people joining us today and also recognise that First Nations people have been involved in technology and storytelling for a very long time. And a lot of what I'm doing now at the 3A Institute is just an extension of that way of interpreting the world. Um, because of that, I sort of live in my own little bubble here of a couple of horses and a whole lot of trees. Um, I was a doomsday prepper way before this crisis came. So our pantry's uh, full of food and I probably had to limit how much I'm buying to be um, kind of everybody else. So no, I'm doing just fine. Thanks for asking. Great to hear. I also realize I should, should have given you a bit of a, a bit of context there for those who don't remember it from the event description. So I might go to you, Katrina, next, who is the who's both a curator and also the head of uh, photography and media arts at ANU School of Art and Design. How are you feeling about everything? How's it for last month? <laughs> everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really glad um, 
sorry, just to build on what Andrew was saying, I was thinking I'm actually feeling really thankful as well um, because I, um, I, I've kind of returned to my home country, Australia, after 15 years in London, um, escaping Brexit and also escaping um, quite difficult conditions over there with friends and family. So um, uh, I feel just very glad to be in the Canberra bubble <laughs> right now and thankful um, that I'm able to continue working and um, ha only have minor inconvenience of th a three-year-old at home and able to continue teaching. So um, I, I feel very privileged under the conditions that we're all um, existing right now. Absolutely. And um, our last speaker, John Tess Parker, who's the head of politics and government and Instagram, and also uh, a former advisor to, to Julia Gillard as well. Um, uh, John, how are, how are you going? How have you been feeling over the last month or so? You've had a bit more of a, oh, you've, you've muted yourself. Damn, there we go. Oh, no. We're all trying to help. There we, <laughs> there we go. go. How, how have you been feeling over the last month and a half? You've had a bit of a different journey to some of, to Andrew and, and Katrina and I. Yeah, exactly. Um, so over the, firstly, thank you all so much and my incredibly esteemed uh, co-panelists um, for inviting me to join join you guys in this conversation, which is really close to my heart. Um, uh, one of the one of the most amazing things is just seeing how people are communicating with each other and then consuming media that is visual uh, over the course of the, the last couple of weeks of this crisis. But um, uh, I uh, I was actually in Australia for one of my closest friends' weddings at the start of March and. Um, in the end, decided that it, I, I'd, I'd stay in Australia rather than rather than risk um, uh, jumping on the plane and getting back to the United States, which is my home uh, these days. And so, deeply grateful to be here in the time that I get to spend with my family, uh, but also very concerned uh, for my for my friends and and their families uh, in in, um, in the US, and then also the communities over there that are severely affected right now. Uh, so, certainly want to recognise that, but um, really excited for this conversation. Awesome. And, and I um, absolutely am as well. I think it's going to be really interesting. So just to, to segue into that, more than words, um, uh, it's images that really stick with us and shape our perspectives on big and complicated issues. I feel like if, if I was to mention sort of the Vietnam War or September 11, there are distinctive images that come to mind uh, that, that come before the feeling or, or even the words you put to describe that. And I think in moments like this, um, especially when we're stuck in our homes, images play an even more important role in informing what, how we understand what's happening in our own countries and communities, but but also right across the globe. Um, so um, uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, open up our little deck and start screen sharing with you all. Um, I'm also going to drop this into the chat as well. So if you'd like to play along at home or see stuff in slightly higher resolution, um, feel free to to open it up. Um, just keep an eye on which uh, which slide we're on so that you can, you can stay with us. So um, let me... Just get that up. Great. Hopefully, you are all now seeing uh, seeing us. Um, God, I might just pull up my chat as well. Great. Um, do let me know if if you guys can't see that, but I'm going to be operating on the assumption you can. So. I just wanted to start um, having a look at uh, some of these photos at the beginning. And, and Andrew, I might even call upon you to provide a bit of, a bit of um, commentary here. But um, I think one thing that was remarkable is seeing these scenes from Wuhan. Um, and these were photos predominantly taken in January and in uh, February. Um, we couldn't help but see that this was a bit of an omen of things to come. Um, yeah, Andrew, when you see these photos, what, what stands out to you? Yeah, look, I mean, part of it's my background on the newspaper. You, We had an opportunity, you know, I've been there a long time, uh, to have a really good data set, a data stream. So you can imagine the world before the internet was a thing. We used to have subscription services to around the world. And we get two photos from America and they'd come in analogue. So you had this little window that other people didn't have. So I think I have a bit of muscle memory around that, that you get a view of something. And there's a science fiction author called William Gibson who comes up with a came up with a fantastic phrase saying the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And at the Institute where I am now at ANU, we apply that to sort of technology and other aspects. But I think here is my background as photographer is that the pictures can often 
tell you what happened in the past, but they can also inform the future. And I think what we're going through here, my boss, Genevieve Bell, is talking about we're in a liminal moment, which is an anthropological term, which we think of preliminary. We're going through something. And when you have a ritual, which is an anthropologist background, there's an ordered set of events that people follow through. And then there's a moment of uncertainty. And I think all of us are going through that uncertainty. And for me, this data set, if you want to call it that, these pictures from Wuhan gave us a sense of what was coming, but we weren't really paying attention. And now we're getting to live what's actually, those scenes that we're seeing in these images, they're all very familiar to us now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's really unnerving actually to see it because so many of these really do mirror um, images that we've seen here. Um, John or Katrina, have you, have you had any kind of observations when looking back at some of these early uh, shots coming out of China? Well, I'll just jump in and say, for me, um, these images, um, they, they seem like missives from another planet at that point. And I think for me, what, what really actually uh, viscerally uh, made sense to me was actually the written testimonies of people going through this. And I think I really understood what COVID meant when I was reading the reports of people on the front line of the, the, the things coming, things that my students who were in China were telling me. And uh, for me, these images can't tell the story. They're, they're almost a fragment of, of what, what's to come. It can't quite tell you <laughs> the no. immensity. Um, and for me, these images um, are like you were saying, Andrew, portents or missives from a future, but you can't quite read them yet. Mm. Um, and for me, it was the words at those early points that really helped me understand the emotional and um, psychological aspects of that. Yeah, I think a big part of it when I was looking at these things was, was realising that um, often, we, often we will see futuristic environments depicted as, as Asian cities. And mm. uh, it kind of almost felt a little bit sci-fi to me when, when <laughs> Um, you know, it was easy to kind of disassociate and think it was just another another world. Um, moving into, uh, we've, we're going to try and break up some of these questions into um, uh, into a couple of different sections. Um, and the first one is is leadership. So looking at how uh, our leaders have responded to, uh, or images that show how leaders have been responding to the crisis. Less about the policies and more just about um, the things that have been revealed. And I think... Um, looking at this uh, was one that, that occurred to me um, was there's, there's no room for uh, subtlety when it comes to the relationships between our public servants. Uh, if someone's not necessarily on the same page, you see it really, really overtly. Um, uh, more subtly in Australia, but quite overtly in the US. Um, and also I think the way that um, uh, our leaders have kind of become uh, teachers when they're doing it well. Um, I, I might also open this up to particularly um, John and Andrew, but also Katrina, if you have thoughts, um, people who've worked in political offices, um, what do you think the role of leaders are in this time? Well, and who's doing it well and, and what makes it work well? Yeah, for sure. I can, I can take that uh, to start uh, before, before kicking it over to my fellow panellists. But what I'm really fascinated by is the way that people generally around the world have a real yearning for really good high quality information during a time like this. And in a health crisis, like what we're experiencing, government and political leaders really have a monopoly on that information. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the channels through which we access them then become really interesting because there is a place for all of them. Uh, more generally, there has been a massive shift in, throughout society to visual communication, uh, whether it's the 6 p.m. news or whether it's the, uh, the Instagram stories that you consume right now. And so if we just stop there for a second, uh, uh, actually might go back to Meg Garcetti as an example, Daniel. Uh, we have, this is a really interesting example of six posts that Meg Garcetti in Los Angeles has, has put on his Instagram account over the course of the last couple of weeks. And there is a lot of very clear information that is being delivered in a very uh, appropriate way for the, for the medium that he's communicating within. In this case, it is Insta the Instagram feed. And so there is a combination of him as, a, as the individual 
recorded in a video carrying this information to his to his citizens and those constituents want in this space to be able to access this you can see that just purely from reading through the comments and seeing the engagement levels that all of this media is getting uh, on that on the platform but then also looking at the way that there is this clear bilingual approach to, to, to carrying this information. Uh, and if you go then to the next example, uh, Daniel, this is uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany, who up until this moment had never done uh, video messages like, like this. Uh, and so that was a really big statement for, the, and there's some fascinating articles in uh, some different outlets. One is in the, the Atlantic and one is in the New Republic, which I would encourage you all to have a quick Google and look up. But the way that Chancellor Merkel has been communicating is really, and, and, and the reality that this is a new way of communicating is a really interesting sing signal to us that this is a massive shift into meeting the demand of her constituents, the German people, for this clear information in the places where they consume it. And you can see that from just the view count there on that video. Uh, so I think this is a really interesting way where there are multiple places where these government leaders are investing in trying to get uh, medium specific information so that people can people can re recognize it and then consume it. And John, just on, on um, Angela Merkel, as I understand, uh, she's been quite a traditional communicator so far, hasn't she? Like, it's, like as much as uh, Australians might not be surprised to see somebody doing a piece to camera over Facebook or Instagram, that's quite a shift for her, isn't it? Yeah, this is, and once again, I would encourage anyone who's more interested in this to, to look at those articles in the New Republic and the Atlantic, but, and maybe we can post them in the chat, but this has been a, a very big difference to the way that uh, her government has been communicating and having her as the spokesperson providing that empathy through these videos uh, and that connection and that surety through these videos has been really interesting. You can then go to this example. This is a, a quick Instagram story on the left from um, Prime Minister Johnson in the UK. And then what comes from the government account, which is uh, 10 Downing Street, where there is clear information on the different stages that need to be set by, um, uh, by the UK before they're able to start opening up um, for, or for them to be able to start changing the rules. But it's interesting that the, the way that they're communicating here is both very clear information, but then also a closeness to a leader who has obviously gone through a very, uh, personally, a very traumatic time with, um, with having, having, having the virus and having to, have, uh, having to recover from it. Yeah. We've, we've got a couple more um, Instagram story kind of government examples to come up, which, which um, I think, John, you'll naturally have a lot to say on. Before we get too far away from it, though, I did want to come back to this photo um, of Jacinta because these, these, these curve graphs, we've seen a lot of them over the last couple of weeks. Not necessarily strictly a photo, but, but is definitely a form of visual communication. And I know that, um, Andrew, you had commented that um, there was a bit of an interesting history behind this graph, wasn't there? Yeah, look, I mean, I'll just pick up from where John was. I think Merkel's style of communication can be put down to her background in physics and chemistry. Uh, and that leads us to the graph here, which again was put out by the Academy of an epidemiologist explaining how the health system uh, could be overwhelmed. But what was interesting that in terms of public communication, these graphs that we're all pretty much familiar with now did not have the dotted line that showed the threshold of a, of a health service. It's somewhat of a fixed point. We can try and raise that as we increase our health services. Uh, and it's been the language adopted by politicians, you know, came from a science com background. And I think the point here, too, is that politicians almost always are speaking in the future tense. That's the world they live in, in predicting the future. And you saw it in our Prime Minister in an election frame, just as we were at where we were a year ago, that we were the budget was back in black in the future. He really muddled around the tenses around that political statement and then the accountability and credibility happens over time and obviously we've come a year on and that that statement is false and I think you're seeing with these graphs the politicians are having a really hard time because they're trying to predict the future which is really hard for anyone I'm not just being mean to politicians it's hard for anyone and yet they're getting data, daily data to test what they've promised and what they've said and the actions they've taken, which is why we're seeing in Australia a bit of a diversity between the states uh, and the feds because the accountability measures are a little bit different. You know, education and health are paid for and managed by state politicians uh, and the sort of, you know, bigger headline numbers and GDP and some of those other things. So there's different motives coming from our political leaders. So the first point I'd say is just understanding where political speech is coming from. And the second one, which is probably exemplified by Trump, 
uh, in one of your earlier pitches is perhaps communication and control. I mean, John knows the dark arts of political communication, uh, that you, you try to control the narrative. And I think we're seeing here that that's being played out um, way beyond the politician's ability to shape that. Yeah, absolutely. Just, while you see something like the COVID safe app is something that could be seen to be done, you know, it, it's visible and there's a collective action and agency around that. And so you see them grappling to say, I'm doing everything I can to keep you safe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in order to keep us moving, I might just quickly touch on this slide, which is interesting to me because it's um, not necessarily leaders with their own personality, but institutions that that uh, can be a bit more fluid. John, do you want to, like, what are you seeing when you look at, people communicating visually here like why are these remarkable to you yeah uh, so to just start on the the most visually attractive here when we go back to that idea of who has a uh, a very clear advantage one uh, when when communicating one always comes to mind is nasa they have the only ability you know they have one of the three institutions that is able to pr provide images from space which is amazing um, and they're a really amazing account that you, I would encourage everyone to, to follow on Instagram uh, because they do do such an amazing job uh, teaching people uh, interesting things, whether it's in this case uh, about ice caps melting or whether it's about um, Im images, for, images from different perspectives of around the world. Uh, so I heavily encourage that. But what I think is really interesting about this is that it's mixing substantive information uh, with with the visual and so this is a trend that i think has come more and become more and more interesting over the course of the last couple of years of uh the stories uh, format across multiple platforms becoming more prevalent in communications uh, but being able to combine this very quick ephemeral style of communicating with substantive information and so nasa does an amazing job of that because it does keep your attention if you want to learn more you just have to keep tapping through this story and you're provided more almost uh, uh specific points that you can consume um, the one on the left was really in interesting to me because it does project a different brand identity for uh something of you know of, of, a, of a defense force in this case it's the canadian army uh, and this image is incredibly powerful to me because it shows it, it's an entry point into how this institution is protecting its citizens. And so uh, this is an example, I, I think, of uh, this particular um, member of the military in, in Canada uh, creating, creating some masks. So I think we're seeing a, a massive adoption of this type of communicating by government and government institutions around the world because we know that you've got a huge audience at home that is consuming this stuff, this type of media. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Can I jump in and also say yeah. that that image of the soldier, it really harks back to kind of World War II photography, the war effort, everyone getting in, you know, which, which might come up later, I think, in the discussion too, in the imagery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, please uh, forgive me, my uh, uh, internet connection is slightly struggling with uh, all of the singing and dancing, but great. Um, now we're going to move on to the next section, which is which is deserted. Uh, and I think one of the most remarkable things is, uh, which we kind of touched on at that first opening section about Wuhan, is we're starting to see the world in a radically different light. And in many respects, it's quite artistic, um, but in others, it's it's also quite daunting and quite isolating. So Katrina, when we look at these, um, particularly given you have a bit more of a, a, a sort of fine arts uh, background rather than a, a practical background like the others here, what are you seeing? What stands out to you when you see photos like this? Well, I'm immediately put in the position of the photographer who, um, how do you represent a pandemic when everyone's inside? <laughs> Not much is happening on the streets. And you, you think photography has always been a tool of spectacle. Um, if we think of Andreas Gursky's artworks, which show capitalism in its full force, the stock market, people on the streets. And now somehow there is this, this stillness. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, these sorts of empty cities, it's almost, again, uh, supernatural. It's strange. Um, and there's almost a pornographic desire to see from our inside our little domestic spheres, imagine what the city that we know has been transformed. And these photographers are doing precisely that. And, and how do you photograph absence and absence of activity? Um, and how do we um, turn this into a very monumental 
sort of poetic mode, like, you know, we're swooning over <laughs> a beach that suddenly is, is, is bereft of people. Um, so I think you look at, um, uh, it's almost like it's staged, which is another kind of key, key method of um, contemporary art photography. So, and, and there's almost a reveling here in the architecture of, be, of, of the spaces being revealed by the absence of people. Um, so I th think that's really an attempt in a, a very certain kind of photography to monumentalize and um, uh, how do you make these, these, these everyday spaces um, um, unusual and thrilling to look at again, given that these images are also in magazines and newspapers and need to draw attention and be iconic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew, I might also go to you on this because I know that you'd had some kind of like interesting thoughts and reflections on um, the way that um, these empty spaces were appearing. Yeah, look, it's a bit of a gift as a practitioner. I mean, in the, in the newspaper photojournalism world that I've come from, the mantra you're almost doing every time you raise your camera is to isolate and exaggerate. You actually have a very political point of view when you raise that camera. And Katrina very rightly says that uh, these images, you are the sole viewer, you're in the shoes of the photographer. And I think the other thing you're doing as a practitioner is whether you're taking a landscape photograph um, you're, you're trying to say something. You're trying to build some tension, some narrative, uh, some conflict in during. So where the ocean meets the beach, there's a wave, right? So where the shadow meets the bright, you, you can find conflict visually in lots of different ways, pattern, form, line. You've got all these tools at your disposal. And uh, here, what you're, the tension you're building is the familiar, and then it's been rendered unfamiliar and strange with the absence of people. So your brain as a viewer is filling that gap in. And that concept of the familiar and unfamiliar is actually well known to us in lots of other storytelling mechanisms. And there's a, a Freudian term and some others have added to it called the uncanny. And we most often see that in sci-fi where you have a robot that's some, you know, whether it's Blade Runner or Terminator, we're sort of familiar with that, but it can express itself um, in lots of different ways. Um, you know, the film Psycho is based on this sort of concept. Uh, so I think to me, that's what's happening here and why these photographers are deliberately picking icons in these different cities so that they're familiar both to people who live there and, and on a worldwide scale. And I think there's something there in a public space with no public that just doesn't sit. Uh, and then the scale of this, that these images are postcards from around the world uh, that all have a common thread. I also think it's really interesting. One thought, just looking back at these again afresh, now that we're talking about them, almost every single one of these have one person in them. It's not completely devoid, and uh, it's not like there's small groups of people. It's there's there's always a person just to give it that sense of scale and context. Yeah, I think, and to me that that's both photographer finding a point of interest to mm -hmm. add to that complexity. It's empty, but it's not empty. Um, and also I think it goes through to the, we are both the photographer when we view this, but we could be that person. Imagine I am, you know, I'm feeling isolated. Well, I am isolated as is the whole world isolated. And I couldn't help but think when I looked at all of these images and I'd love to get Katrina's take on this, that it reminded me of perhaps the very first photograph that was really shared by Louis Daguerre in 1839. It's not by Louis Daguerre. It's, yeah. it's not. What? I had oh, to correct the, the, well, the, the for you. <laughs> It's not the first photograph, but it's like the, this is the same photograph, right? So yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. we can we could spend an hour discussing the first photograph. What I meant was first sort of street scene in mm, way. I think totally, he yeah. did, a, did a barn. Henry Fox Talbot did the windows in his abbey. Um, so yeah, all this was swirling around. The tech was swirling around. But this picture, I think, is just when I saw those empty world pictures, like no, this reminds yeah. me of something. Um, and this this wasn't because of a pandemic. This was because the sensor at the time that the photograph needed a very long exposure and people these streets are full of carts and horses and people moving around and they just weren't rendered on the image. So there's yeah. a problem with data collection, but there is one person there in the bottom left-hand corner, perhaps getting their shoes shine. I think some experts have found one or two other people lurking there in a where's Wally kind of competition, but um, <laughs> there's definitely an echo of the origins of photography in what we're seeing recently. Yeah. It's also funny uh, because I feel like if anyone who knows me knows that my holiday photos are usually quite absurd. And uh, one of my favorite tricks is just to essentially take like 400 photos on a tripod and then average them out to remove all the people, which is kind of what they did kind of <laughs> at the start. Um, um, can I just jump in? There is actually a far more qualified photography historian on the chat and Daniel Palmer has 
<laughs> jumped in and said it is Degas' image. Damn it. <laughs> oh, that, that one is Degas, but, but you're right, Katrina, and Nipis did beat him in terms of rendering an image. We're just sort of arguing over oh. how, the, how the image was fixed and shared, I guess. So it's different ways to come about. Yeah, and um, I, as much as I would love to indulge in that conversation, <laughs> I will keep us moving. Um, the, the other kind of thing that I wanted to capture in this deserted section, um, which is not necessarily completely deserted, but does speak to the kind of scale and the uncanny that Andrew mentioned, is there's, there's been a number of photos that have come through that, that just show the almost industrialised nature of, of death or, uh, or of um, social service provision or uh, medical care that, that just... Uh, really put the stakes of what we were facing into context for me personally. So like here we can see a, a priest kind of, um, this is where I reveal my, my uh, lack of faith, um, <laughs> going through the process of um, uh, kind of helping people through their last rites or, or, or preparing them for burial. Um, we can see large scale uh, burial plots being dug up across Brazil. Uh, and this is, is another one. Um, and I think uh, this next one, uh, sorry, um, I think we, it was in the wrong spot. This one here, which we kind of touched on before, looks kind of passive and isolated and empty, but this actually, um, the story behind this changed my read of it, which is this is actually, these cars are all full and these are people queuing up to get to a food bank in um, the Southern United States. Um, so kind of like showing the scale of the, the human cost in a different, different sort of way. Um, uh, you see here, we can see uh, preparations, I think it's in South Korea um, for uh, care. And these are some mega hospitals that are being built right, like, you know, within weeks uh, across, across Wuhan. Um, oh, and the last one was, was this, which is essentially uh, obituaries or um, death notices in newspapers going for pages and pages and pages to the, to the broader panel. When you see these photos, what do you think they're, they're showing in terms of how are they showing scale and, and how do people respond emotionally when seeing those features of these images? Open to whoever wants to. Mm, I was doing that awkward Zoom pause to let Katrina jump in. Um, <laughs> yes. I think scale, hey, I'm, I've got the mic now. Um, scale, yeah, is really important. I think as a photographer, you struggle to do that. Um, uh, so here, repetition, uh, the drone shot from Wuhan, and then, yeah, I picked up, I was really found it emotive seeing that, you know, pages and pages of obituaries, because one of the things here is what's not being shown, what's not being photographed. And for me, there's a bit of a curatorial aspect to this that goes through to access in the hospitals. You know, we're not seeing photographs, uh, graphic ones of what it looks like in an ICU. Uh, and it also reminds me of some of the brilliant work that's been done in the past on previous epidemics. So I'm thinking here around Ebola. Uh, and there, there's sort of a, a different gaze going on where, where dead bodies are sort of have been put into the public space uh, because it's an other. You know, there's sort of, there's definitely something playing on here around, I'm sure stuff's being photographed, but I don't think it's being widely disseminated um, that, that uh, this section of photographs made me think that people are finding different ways to visualise what's not seen. And I think we're, why the drone photos of graves give you a sense of that and, and trying to find some of those more difficult conversations around inequality mm. that's really being accentuated and enhanced through the, um, you know, the, the difficult circumstances that you know, millions of people are facing. Yeah, I'd like to just pick up on that, which is some um, kind of point of view. And... Um... I found myself uh, not going to Instagram, but places like Reddit and um, where people are leaking out, the leakiness of people's devices are being distributed. So like videos of bodies lying up in corridors and precisely those sorts of images that are the sort of user generated um, difficult images that are circulating in different parts and through different networks rather than these kind of iconic dramatic attempts to create very formal, beautiful scale. And also these images give the sense of like, um, this is war, you mm. know, like mm. this is, you know, the beds lined up um, and certain, um, this idea of the militarizing nature of the pandemic is something that is a rhetoric that's been a lot in British media 
uh, which healthcare workers have resisted by saying, well, you're going to sacrifice us then, and um, mm -hmm. this is justified. So, you know, these are very political images, um, even though they're very beautiful. Um, and I'm also interested in the images that we're not seeing, that people are circulating in different formats, um, and uh, how algorithms are also privileging certain images versus others in the feeds. Um, is a really um, important thing to be talking about, as well as the content of the images. 100%, yeah. And I think that um, uh, th there's an extremely clinical nature to a lot of the stuff that we have been seeing. And um, I, I, on a personal level, I'm kind of glad, I don't know if I have the emotional resilience to see some of the stuff I have glimpsed through places like Reddit, but um, I think it'll be interesting to see the other side of this story that's told once we look back on it in a couple of months. I'm going to keep us moving forward um, uh, and now to into home, which kind of riffs on that point, which is there is a lot of personal stories being told through this crisis. And um, I'll, I'll do what I did before. I'll just give a quick run through of what we're seeing here. And then I might throw it to you, John, as, as somebody who has a lot of experience with people manufacturing their own content about like um, what might be happening there and, and what, um, what we've been seeing. But but here we can see uh, an Australian Olympian uh, who is training for uh, the, you know, the, the possibly still happening Olympics. We're not like entirely sure, um, but uh, that's exciting. Her name is like Joe Bridge and Jones. Um, then we uh, see a similar thing here with uh, the German fencer, Alexandra uh, Nadoldo, um, who's training in her house with a little bit of a, a, a sparring partner. She's built herself out of pillows, which I thought was remarkable. Um, a, a couple who very recently gotten married in Lithuania, um, sharing a intimate moment that is also not that intimate uh, with their masks. Um, uh, we see a man on his balcony in Madrid during the Pride Festival in that town that had largely been um, put off because of this, but trying to still create it from their balcony. Um, images, endless, endless images of sourdough bread. I feel like bakers, I would hate to be a baker after this because everyone's going to know how to do it themselves and want to go back to just cooking it at home. Um, but when we see kind of images like this, and we've got some more we'll go into, but I might just throw to John here now that we're getting to a lot of this user-generated stuff. What, um, it seems like this has been a really interesting period of creativity uh, that people have been turning to manifest their own creativity at home, but also that that has told us a lot about how they're emotionally processing this in this context. Um, have you seen, like, does that sound right to you, John, or have you seen any interesting examples of those things? For sure. So I think one of the most interesting things to digest right now is that we are going through one of the most remarkable shared experiences globally uh, that has happened in my lifetime, maybe has happened in the lifetime of most people on this planet, uh, where we are all in a very, in a, in a very similar boat. Uh, we're all stuck at home. We all need to continue to be stuck at home for, a, for, for, for that kind of shared um, uh, response to the health crisis. Now, what that's triggered on one level is a lot of motifs like that sourdough bread, where people are participating in these almost shared stories that are a part of the larger shared experience. And so challenges have become incredibly prominent on social media uh, or just trends. And so some examples of, of what that might be are the, are the sourdough challenge. Um, then this one here is really interesting, just m more general motifs of, of people doing interesting stuff to pass the time at home. So here's an example that was shared on, the, on, on Instagram's official Instagram account, uh, which our, um, our, our, our team uh, found. And I think it's remarkable where it's this person who's a, an amazing rock climber and you can, you can see the, um, uh, the account there, Brooke Climbs, uh, where you, this is a 40 second video of her basically going from one end of her kitchen to the other to be able to open up her fridge and get a snack without touching the floor. Uh, so amazing examples of creativity like that that are being shared. And that fantasy is something that because we are all going through the same collective experience is just fun to watch. Uh, and, and that's, that's been something that I think is interesting. If you go to the, the, the immediate previous um, example, one of the more serious ones, but a very simple example as well is just people sharing images of, of themselves staying home. Uh, this is an example of a political leader participating in that visual conversation. 
Uh, so this is Governor, Cu Governor Cuomo. And you can see these examples coming from a lot of different types of political and government leaders, whether they are elected, whether, whether they're bureaucrats, whether they're, they're part of, um, whether they're part of uh, uh, monarchies. And so this is an interesting example because it's something that we can all relate to. It's yeah. dinner at home. Um, and so jumping through two slides, sorry, we're going a little bit out of order, Daniel. Right. Um, one of the things that has been, you know, there are various types of these shared conversations that are happening. The one in the middle here was just the most beautiful trend in the people thanking uh, health heroes. So uh, I don't know where it started, but certainly uh, seeing all my friends who are in uh, Manhattan and, and in New York City broadly right now, they're getting out on their on their front uh, stoops and they're uh, cheering and clapping uh, at 7 p.m. every night. And so that content was is, is being posted by all these people. They are celebrating digitally these these amazing healthcare workers and frontline workers more generally. Uh, and so one of the one of the things that we actually were able to uh, build into the into the product was the ability to collate all these stories into a, uh, a thanks story, uh, which would, um, would appear on at the front of your stories tray. And that's an example of what that would look like on the left there. Um, another part of that trend was some more deep storytelling that came from a lot of celebrities that were just trying to reinforce the, uh, uh, the idea of why we're doing this. Uh, and so Kevin Bacon started this trend or, you know, there might, might have been others before, but Kevin Bacon was one of the, one of the incredibly prominent people who were, were initially part of the trend and then backed up by um, Governor Cuomo uh, and subsequent uh, celebrities like J-Lo, uh, where they basically said, this is the person who I'm staying for, mm -hmm. staying home for. So in this case, Governor Cuomo is staying home for his, uh, for his mum. Um, and if you go to the next one, uh, yeah. Daniel, Another really great follow on various, um, whether it's on Twitter or on, on Instagram, is uh, the New York Times um, culture uh, reporter, Taylor Lorenz. Um, she's uh, found this amazing trend, which is high school, graduating high schoolers in the United States. So they're all about to graduate because it's the end of the school year over there right now. Uh, and there's usually a lot of things like going to your prom, which is similar to our formals in, in Australia and in New Zealand, um, and having the, the end yearbook, which celebrates the class. And so people are starting to do that digitally. And this is an example of how they're doing that on Instagram. Because we're, you know, all those students are stuck at home and they want to remember fondly these experiences of, of, of their upbringing and, and be able to, to share that with each, share in that communal, uh, communal moment with, um, with each other. So I think what is happening right now is an incredible amount of creativity. Uh, people are producing different types of content, uh, whether it's on platforms like Instagram, other social media platforms, or also just simply just photography. Like I've been really enjoying just taking photos in the backyard with my with my um, with my family, uh, which haven't gone on social media, but there is this kind of yearning for the ability to to participate in storytelling visually. Yeah, I, I might move us forward. There's like so much more on on this section. I know that we could we could explore, and I know that um, both Andrew and Katrina have many comments. But I, I might, in the interest of time, move us ahead. You do all have the deck in your in the chat, so do pull it up and spend more time looking at each of these if you'd like. But the other thing that to just touch on was um, there's also the this explosion of these really intimate, lovely portraits of, of folk looking out into the world, um, people getting very creative with their kids. Um, this one in particular, uh, which uh, Andrew had spoken to, which was by Alex Ellinghausen, who works for the Herald of uh, where the wild things are type thing that, that has been now recreated by a lot of people out in uh, on their own social media. Just, it's a really fun little device, little technique. Um, these kind of intimate moments. I know a number of people uh, who are kind of riffing on John's point of, who have families have uh, actually oddly enjoyed the time to spend focused intimacy, which many of us don't get too much of a chance to do. Um, uh, as well as these kind of really interesting scenes where you kind of see people within their little um, animized, uh, atomized boxes uh, still trying to connect or process what's happening around them. Um, that also, I think, capture kind of the the culture and, and other components about each of the places that these photos are taken. You can see a lot about who these people are, what kind of lives they live normally and um, the different challenges they might be experiencing in those moments. 
um, some really giving you an opportunity to have a, a lot of emotional um, connection. This one I thought was very charming of uh, the Easter Bunny coming out to, to help <laughs> uh, help folk a couple of weekends ago. Um, uh, this, this from Russia where essentially it was saying, uh, please stay home with your loved ones, take care of yourself and your loved ones. Um, and uh, this section here, which and I'll, and I'll encourage folk to kind of keep um, tight, quest, tight comments just because I, I do really want us to cover this and our, our last remaining section and have a bit of space for questions is, is really on uh, grief. Uh, and this is some of the, the darker, more challenging photos that have come to light and that have provoked kind of anxiety responses in, in many of us, even though, as we talked about earlier, there, there hasn't been as much of that as um, we know exists, but some has come out. Um, and so, uh, Andrew, I might, might open to you here to provide some kind of comments as I scroll through them. Oh, look, yeah, this was just a set of pictures I came across from Alex Majoli in from Italy. Uh, but again, they sit within that sort of film noir, cinematic, romantic kind of look and feel, which you kind of do when you're doing a photo essay. So there's some sort of continuity. Um, and again, it's sort of this replication of the sci-fi uh, hazmat suit and the mask. And obviously with the photos we've put up today, we've haven't really dwelt on the mask, but it's a, it's a go-to visual that will mark 2020 in our minds forever. And it made me think of back a hundred years ago to 1918, 1919, where similarly uh, the images from that era are all marked um, by the mask. Mm. We've also seen some kind of interesting, and we talked about this a bit before um, with when we were talking about the clinical nature of some of the scale photos. We've seen some interesting new ways of representing people's space and, and becoming a lot more aware of what the government does or doesn't know about us in this process. And I thought, um, again, um, Andrew, and, and I'm interested in Katrina's take on this as well. We These photos really emphasize both of those points, but are also oddly artistic because of their use of color. <laughs> Um, and you, did you, I think, Andrew, you know the context. Do you want to talk us through exactly what? Uh, yeah, it's just, it was just a thermal camera from Paris. And I, yeah, for the points that you've raised, to sort of we're entering into camera surveillance, um, which I think is a really interesting era um, for all of us. And then obviously the thermal aspect to this, where, you know, temperature is a indicator of health. But I'm, I'd love to hear Katrina's view. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think it's um, aestheticizing. <laughs> The pandemic a lot of the and if you even look at the grief images like you were saying like there's something very like painterly like the madonna the pieta all these kinds of imagery from art history is also there coming to me in the way the light happens um and then you know artists are exploring all different kinds of surveillance um apparatuses in their practice to be able to find new ways of representing the world in a kind of non-human way because our cameras are now uh, computers and have a very you know can represent the world in multiple different ways so um it's quite interesting and if even to link back at the previous um sl set of slides that were by magnum photographers of domesticity um i can't help but compare these images from magnum getty with real user generated content like the reality of being at home or the reality of grief which is um, I can't help but think of a meme, many of you might have seen it, of the working from home image, where it's someone at a computer with the children with giant masking tape taped onto the floor, you know. So there is this kind of romantic, aestheticized vision of the pandemic. And then there's user generated content, which is like, I'm sitting here, I've got my hand on my child. It's not all we're making art amongst the cushions and that sort of thing. And we get the spotlight and play, you know. So I think um, I think again, you know, what who are these images for and what are they trying yeah. to make us feel is a good question too. Like I'll, I'll just pick up there, Katrina. It reminded me of the section John was articulately running through us there on um, that sort of social media response that I always I've sort of come to this th trying to understand conspiracy theories as a form of participatory fiction. And I think sometimes social media, it's a representation that you are the audience. And so by me copying whatever trend or whatever's going around there, be it a TikTok dance or those other things, I'm, I'm participating in an alternative reality there, a participatory fiction where I get to insert myself as an, as an actor with agency, where perhaps I'm just in that sort of mimetic uh, repetition of, of acting something out. So yeah, I think put all that together and yeah, we start to understand a little bit more. Yeah, I think I think Katrina's point there about um, some of the uh, kind of 
politicized natures about what we're seeing and, and how people are responding kind of really comes through in this last section in grief as well, which is people who've, who've taken it and, and kind of linking with Andrew's point about conspiracy theories have tried to take back some sense of power or some sense of control about a circumstance that feels too big and too beyond our power and too beyond our element of control, um, particularly within the United States where there's a, a whole different political uh, level and layer that sits upon that with their presidential election coming up this year. This man, I thought, had made a, uh, turned his beard into uh, a face mask so that he could go to a rally, which I just thought was just quite um, entertaining. Um, but then more definitively, this photo really, really stood out to me as something um, that was like a definitive moment from this period, which was um, healthcare workers um, who are exposed to the intensity and the pain of what is happening inside those hospital walls, um, just sort of essentially coming out and saying to to a bunch of protesters, like, I don't like, I don't care. This isn't really a matter of opinion. We're just gonna um, stop you in in your way. Um, yeah, I thought this is this is quite an iconic photograph for, for me, at least in this period. And I know that um, this one is another one that uh, is much closer to home. This from a, a Woolworths really early on. Um, we, we deliberately didn't choose any photos of, of people kind of fighting over the toilet paper. But I do think that, that um, this really symbolises a strong emotional response that a lot of people in Australia uh, had. Um, I, I might now move us, unless you guys had any thoughts or comments on some of that uh, risk stuff. I might move us to our last block, which is uh, endurance. So this is essentially, uh, despite all the adversity and challenge and, and to be honest, straight up depressing things that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, um, there's also a lot of stories that speak to our, our grit and our resilience uh, and also to give us hope and give us optimism um, about the future and, and remind us that we live in highly connected societies and that, um, you know, when we're reminded of that people generally come together to look after each other. Um, uh, for example, the, this masks um, uh, kind of theme that, that has been shown. Um, actually, I, I can't remember, Andrew or Katrina, did you contribute these to, um, do you know where they're from? Um, yeah, no, they're from um, Instagram. And again, it's that point I'm making where you see something and then you replicate it. Um, yeah. And in this case, it was sort of pitching. We've touched on a top couple of times here. Health workers, hero. Obviously, we saw that through our horrendous bushfire summer of sort of the, in, their, in that case, it was sort of yellows, PPE equipment of the firefighter as the signifier yeah. of identity rather than the individual. Um, and that's, I think we're starting to see it again here. Yeah, and I think one thing that was really remarkable to me is I, I definitely saw this when it came to uh, popping up in Western contexts, but it was interesting to go back and realise that this this photo essentially began uh, in January. Um, this was something that, that was already kind of being constructed in the telling of this story in China. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to see it's, it, it kind of roll continuously into, um, into other parts of the world, um, really showing the, the battle scars, so to speak, of, of this. Um, this photo as well, which is, is almost cinematic in the way that it's showing kind of fatigue and, and burnout. Um, uh, but on a more optimistic note, we can also see here um, some of the uh, celebrations that John touched on before as well. And, um, and I might open, open up back up to John to speak a little bit about this as well, which is uh, the way that communities have, have sitting at home, having a lot of spare time, have started just exploding out into the public, um, that kindness to the people who are holding, uh, holding everything together for us. So I think like, uh, is there, is, I guess what I'd say to, to you, John, as a more specific question is, are there other types of gratefulness that you've seen represented in images across the world? Like do, does the way that people in the UK respond different to, um, I realize you might be muted. So we'll, we'll, pull you out <laughs> um, but yeah is, is the way that um, i'm here I'm, I'm out of i'm, I'm out of my uh, i'm out of my prison um, <laughs> yeah is the way that uk's kind of like um visually responding to this different obviously here we need, we've got we've got a pause but um in india obviously uh, a really different uh, kind of responses um you know flowers uh, are shown all over policemen as they walk down the street yeah i think i think there are there are definitely kind of, Na kind of nation specific trends and then there would also be these transnational trends as well uh, so examples of what those transnational trends might be is uh, thanking health workers it, I've been 
uh, there's a 10 push-up challenge that I've been tagged on that I refuse to participate in um, to the detriment of all my friends. And so how that works for those uh, who don't know is that um, a friend of mine might post onto, onto Instagram uh, a video of them doing 10 push-ups in their lounge room or in their backyard if they're lucky to have one. Uh, and then they would tag a couple of their friends and effectively nominate them to be able to, uh, uh, to participate in that in that in that challenge and then i would do my push-ups and then i would tag somebody else and so people get really creative uh using this as a moment to express themselves and to to be able to throw their creativity into production of that tiny little moment that links you with this great uh almost domino effect across um across different different social networks um and that's that's almost complementary to some of the some of the broader things that are also happening uh in in australia alone uh instagram live views uh doubled in in uh, in a week in March, which I think is is absolutely remarkable. Um, and then the other thing that is quite quite fascinating is that more than 200,000 people in Australia are members of over 400 different uh, COVID-19 local support groups. And so there are communities that are very much coming together and positively sharing and participating with each other, which I think is a is kind of one you know one of the things that I'm certainly um, leaning into to 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 be able to. Help, help maintain my sanity. Yeah, um, and I realized we actually had this photo too off the back, John, which kind of speaks to some of those those kind of trends that um, people have started tagging themselves in. And this one actually connecting it with a, uh, also kind of rewarding and uh, connecting people who work in healthcare in the process as well. Um, so I think like we've now come to the the end of things here. There's a hundred more thoughts or comments that I've had, and I, I have no doubt um, believe that that's probably true of everyone else on this chat too. But I wanted to um basically throw back to everyone uh, in the room here because we've got a couple more minutes before we finish. What kind of photos have stood out to you? What when looking at these decks, um, what uh, these photos? What has stood out to you in these? Um, are there are there takes you think we may not have? We may have misread something to you or something like that. I'm happy to, to kind of give you all a space to contribute if you can. Um, I'll give you a couple of moments to kind of chip stuff into the chat if you haven't. In the meantime, I'll um, uh, just kind of speak to this photo as well, which I thought was a different kind of take on people being in their, um, being in their homes and seeing them, which is obviously in Australia, we have uh, maintained a very strict sense of quarantine for folk who return to Australia. And we've actually had... Uh, people who are in quarantine try and communicate out uh, out of these hotels that they're being held in and uh, uh, try and connect from afar, which has just been a bit odd. Um, you know, he might be in a hotel room, but sometimes I feel like him when I'm on a Zoom call. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, Katrina, what do you think when looking at these sorts of things? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, just to turn back to the politics of these images and mm -hmm. how they're mobilised, I wanted to just point to another sort of interesting trend in photography, um, which sort of has happened both in um, sort of Brexit, but also now, which is um, the scraping of photographs mm. to create fake Twitter accounts to then get mobilised to um, spread different kinds of positions. Um, and recently, of course, there was this great... Um, interest in a fake Twitter account called NHS Susan, who um, was a, an NHS worker that had been created a Twitter account and she was going around and supporting Boris's herd immunity. And the person whose photo it was was like, that's not me. It's under further investigation. But this idea that these photographs of NHS workers can then be created to create fake identities that then go on to spread misinformation is another interesting life of the photograph in this context that yeah. we haven't really talked about, which is super interesting. Um, and they might take on different uh, roles beyond what the photographer initially um, intended. Absolutely. Um, I might just acknowledge a couple of things that people have put in the chat, which is um, that uh, Rosalie says that we haven't really seen the, glo uh, the growing global inequality um, here, that this will only exacerbate. It, we, we, we say we're not all in this together, but prisons, detention centres, slums are kind of pretty missing and I think that's actually a really telling point there's a lot of places that photographers just haven't had the ability to go to um, and certainly not uh, if they did highly regulated context when they visit and um, Roz mentioned as well something which I think is is uh, true I, I thought as well which is that that cruise ship on Sydney Harbour at the very start was very ominous given how that played out later on 
Um, I'm going to move to wrap up our session today, but um, so I'm going to do some admin. But before um, I do that, I'm just going to throw to our, our three speakers and say, I'd like to really hear, um, and we've got a bit of colour of this already, but what, are, what is something that you have seen over the last couple of weeks, possibly photography related, but maybe even just in your personal lives, that's given you kind of a sense of optimism and hope for, um, for, for our communities um, going forward. This made you feel good in, in, a, in a period where so many things make us feel a bit nervous and a bit stressed. So I'll leave that with you all to, to think over while I just do a bit of admin, um, which is to say, thank you for coming. <laughs> both, both to uh, each of our speakers, so Andrew, Katrina and uh, John, thank you so much. I think you've made a really interesting contribution here and I think we've all really enjoyed um, reflecting on um, on all of these photos. Uh, and also thank you to everyone in the audience who's come and joined us as well. Like I think that uh, uh, this is, is a really enriching thing to do together and um, to think about together. And I'm glad that we've had the chance to do that. Um, we are gonna send out a bit of a feedback sheet in the next uh, sort of 24 hours. Um, I do encourage you to, to do it if you have the time. Um, it only takes a minute or two, but we, we kind of go through and read every comment that's put into it. And it really helps us um, iterate and improve and tighten the the presentations that we do here. Um, I also just kind of wanted to call your attention to what we're doing next week as well. So there's going to be like a lot of really interesting conversations next week. It's going to be a big weekend. Um, in fact, although I realize uh, normally I say that on a Friday, but uh, this evening we're actually having a May Day toast at 6 p.m., which you can still sign up for, which has Thomas Keneally, Sally McManus, and the wonderful Billy Bragg. So um, if you can't normally go to a, if you normally go to a dinner and you can't, there's something there for you this evening. Um, next week, we're going to have on Monday, uh, Safe Refuge, what happens to the, when the world closes its borders. Uh, and so this is a, really a discussion around what it means for people who are seeking asylum in periods like this, where they might be trapped in really unsafe and unpleasant places. Um, for example, there's, you know, refugee camps aren't great places to be at the best of times and definitely not in the middle of a pandemic. We've got our traditional uh, political geek fest on Tuesday, where Catherine Murphy and Peter Lewis pour over the Guardian Essential Report, which is some uh, weekly polling that Essential has been doing, which is really helpful. Um, then on Thursday, one that I'm personally very excited about, which is uh, where we're going to be joined by Malcolm Turnbull and talking about all of the uh, different uh, challenges that he faced during his prime ministership. And more importantly, uh, what people who really care about a range of issues that perhaps they may have felt somewhat disappointed about during his prime ministership, um, uh, what is the path ahead now? What what can we do to to do things there? What has he learned through his time in the prime minister's office that we can learn from um, to to strengthen our approach to whether it be climate change, the republic, um, or a number of other issues like that? Um, then on Friday, uh, in a, a strange twist of fate, we'll then be joined by Lucy Turnbull, uh, not intentional, just weirdly coincidental, um, and talk about urbanism. So what does it mean to live in cities now that we have suddenly started? Um, you know, over the last 10 years, people have been moving back into cities, uh, really enjoying the convenience and um, sense of intimacy that, that city life brings. Um, but, the, you know, the pandemic has made us kind of question a lot of, uh, a lot of those things and, and kind of really many people have moved to their holiday homes, as John Harwin all too well knows, uh, and uh, move out of the city. And what does that mean for the future of the city? Is that going to change how we live? So a really interesting uh, set of conversations next week. I really encourage you to sign up and come along. Um, we were always really keen for you to, to play a bit more of an active role than perhaps we've been able to hear because it's, I guess, we've been focusing on the, the images themselves. But when it's ideas, we really want to hear yours. That's it from me. Um, I might just go back to our three speakers to finish up this uh, session, which is, and I, I might start with you, Katrina. What is something that has uh, given you uh, a sense of like hope and optimism that's made you feel really good over the last couple of weeks? Um, I think that what's been brilliant is in so many different spheres um, and communities I'm engaged in, people are really taking this as a moment to step back and reimagine the future and think, you know, I'm not going to go back to life as normal. How can we build, rebuild a society where, you know, nurses are giving, are not putting their lives on the line. They're getting PPE equipment that, you know, there are different ways of, of, of harnessing our energy as a community and generosity towards each other by staying at home and protecting each other's um, health. How can we, um, yeah, imagine a different future for us all, which I think is the only productive way to <laughs> deal with this moment. Yeah, it's definitely been inspiring to think about um, mm. how we could rebuild. Um, uh, what about uh, you, John? I might go to you next. 
seeing seeing people using various digital tools, social media among them, just seek proactively seeking out their political and, and government leaders to be able to get access directly from the source uh, information, I think has been an amazing phenomena as a as a former political uh, practitioner, but then also now as, a, as somebody that works for a technology company. Uh, that that is fa fascinating, and I'm excited for how that will will change the, the the landscape over over the course of the next couple of years. I think the reverse of that has also been amazing. The investment that that political and government leaders have done to be able to be present on these platforms, to be joining Zoom calls, to be able to go onto Facebook Live, and to you know to be really investing in their Instagram accounts and be able to uh, you know go back and forth with with their constituents has been been really great to see. Absolutely. Andrew, what about you? Yeah, and no, I'm enjoying how I think all of us are growing through this from those narratives of stay home to save grandma, stay home to save capitalism. Um, <laughs> that we, can, we can reimagine that. And I want to pick up where um, Katrina was saying that the pause that's been imposed upon all of us allows us to come back and I think really uh, recognise, as a photographer would, the simple joys um, of a sunrise somewhere other than your bedroom window um, and people, you know, I really miss the, my colleagues and other people I have the, the, the wonderful joy. I do love my family as well. Um, I um, enjoy being with them immensely 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but I'm really looking forward to just simply queuing up to get a cup of coffee. Yeah, I, I'm there with you on that. I, I've never really been one for hanging out at pubs, but suddenly I have this incredible desire to do so. Alrighty, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Um, it's been a really, really good conversation and uh, have a great weekend.